Oops, have we accidentally been calling aliens for the last 60 years? A new study suggests that we have been broadcasting our location to a targeted region of space. So if an advanced civilization is listening, they must know that we're here. But what if we don't want to be found? The dark forest hypothesis assumes that any intelligent life would view other civilizations not as neighbors, but as an inevitable threat. It paints a terrifying picture of the universe where any civilization that reveals itself is quickly and ruthlessly going to be destroyed. So are we scaring away any signs of life or should we be the ones that are scared? Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Lou, and in this week's video we're talking about radio leakage and the water hole and how missions to Mars could have been helping put us on the galactic map for all to see. Now, back in 1974, scientists were using the giant Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico to beam a digital postcard containing simple data, so things about who we are, our numbers, our DNA, a sketch of the human figure and our solar system, and even the telescope itself into space. It was sent towards the globular star cluster M13, which sits about 25,000 light years away. That means it will take 25 5,000 years just for the message to arrive and another 25,000 if anyone is out there to even reply. In other words, our one grand international hello is basically undeliverable on any human timescale. But actually, our first powerful radio transmissions began all the way back in the early 20th century. For the past 100 years, Earth has been buzzing with TV and radio communications. And since these signals travel at the speed of light, they have now created a bubble or radio sphere of human activity that is expanding outwards. As of today, that sphere is roughly 90 to 100 light years in radius, reaching a few thousand stars. But unfortunately, these signals are incredibly weak and have become even weaker over cosmic distances that they've traveled. The reason for this drop off in strength is a fundamental law of physics called the inverse square law. It states that a signal's power decreases in proportion to the square of the distance from its source. Now, if you double the distance, the signal strength is reduced to just one quarter of its original value. If you triple the distance, the signal is going to be just a ninth of before. So it turned out that the signals from our radio sphere would just be way too weak. A civilization, even a few dozen light years away, would require an enormous and highly sensitive radio telescope more advanced than anything we currently have on Earth to detect them. It would appear as a very faint noise among the background static. Also, ironically, as our technology is evolving, our radio leakage is actually decreasing. We're shifting from powerful over-the-air broadcasts to more focused, more efficient communication methods. So things like fiber optics, satellite communication, and low power digital signals. This means that the loudest part of our radio signature from the golden age of TV and radio is already very far away. And this suggests that the best window for a nearby civilization to detect our broadcasts may have already passed. Or so we thought. It turns out that since our first missions to Mars in the 60s, we have been sending more focused, more powerful beams of transmissions into space towards Mars in order to communicate to all of those satellites that we have orbiting around Mars. Since Mars, like all of the other planets, orbit the Sun on the disk that we call the ecliptic plane, Civilizations on star systems located in that same plane are in a very unique position to detect our radio signals. But radio signature is not the only reason. The most common way that we detect exoplanets, planets from outside of our solar system, is through transits. This method is how we have discovered thousands of exoplanets. From a distant star system, a civilization would be able to detect our presence 
by observing our planets, particularly Earth, as they transit in front of the sun, blocking out some of its light and creating this dip in its light curve. So for a civilization to be able to see this happen, they would need to be located almost perfectly within the plane of our solar system, our ecliptic. That means those civilizations on our ecliptic plane are more likely to be looking at us visually, since they know there's a planet here, and also be listening to our radio broadcasts because we're beaming things towards Mars. Now, since our solar system's plane is not aligned with the galaxy, we are tilted at roughly 60 degrees relative to the plane of the galactic disk. This means that most stars will not likely hear our transmissions, only those that are located along the ecliptic plane. The signals that have the best chance of being detected by anyone out there are the most recent, most powerful transmissions. So those are those from our military radars and from our deep space network transmission to Mars in the 60s. An average deep space network transmission is strong enough to be picked up 23 light years away. Now, beyond that point, the signal has weakened so much that it is likely indistinguishable from background cosmic noise. But as time goes on, we'll be able to reach further and further out. Now, for context, our next nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, is just four light years away. Within this 23 light year boundary, that means we have over 500 star systems, each potentially with many worlds just like our Earth. So now what? Well, I think it's a no brainer that if we're serious about finding life beyond Earth, these are exactly the star systems that we should be paying attention to. We should be searching these star systems and their planets for techno signatures, which are signs that a signal was created by technology like our own. Most of the signals that we usually pick up in space are natural. They come from stars, from pulsars, or even from the faint afterglow of the Big Bang known as the cosmic microwave background. These natural sources tend to produce what's called broadband signals. That means that energy is spread out across a wide range of frequencies, kind of like the static that you hear on a radio when it's not tuned to a station. But when it comes to searching for intelligent life, the most promising techno signature is a narrowband signal. Now, these are more likely to be artificial with a specific spike at a specific frequency. And it's designed to do so, so that it can carry information more efficiently. Nature almost never produces signals like that. In 1977, the Big Ear Radio Observatory picked up a powerful 72 second burst of radio waves. It was so strong and so precisely tuned to the frequency of hydrogen that an astronomer wrote WOW next to it. The signal was never detected again, and while some recent studies have given like potential natural explanations of it, it remains one of the most compelling mysteries in astronomy. Right now, astronomers are focusing their attention on a region that we call the waterhole. This is the part of the radio spectrum between 1420 megahertz, which is the natural emission frequency of hydrogen, and 1662 megahertz, which is the frequency for hydroxyl. Put those two things together, hydrogen and hydroxyl, and you'll get H2O, water, the ingredient that we think is essential to life. This part of the spectral is very appealing for two reasons. Firstly, it's relatively radio quiet, so there's less natural noise cluttering it up, which makes any unusual signals here much easier to spot. And secondly, it feels like a very natural meeting place. If any civilizations are out there and also understand basic chemistry and astronomy, they might have the same reason, just like us, that this waterhole is the logical channel for interstellar communication. It's really quite this beautiful idea. Civilizations across the galaxy might choose the same radio quiet frequency to meet and talk. But what if we're wrong? What if the universe isn't a friendly place? Even if a civilization is highly advanced, there is no guarantee that they would be benevolent. In game theory, the safest and most rational move is to eliminate a potential threat before it becomes a real one. 
Even a highly advanced civilization would eventually face limits on energy and resources, and all life, including intelligent life, has this constant drive for growth. The dark forest hypothesis assumes that any spacefaring civilization would view any other intelligent life as an inevitable threat, and thus it would destroy any life that makes itself known. Our broadcasts may mean advanced civilizations are consciously hiding from us or that we are sitting ducks. So maybe the question that we should be asking is not whether or not life exists out there, but whether or not we should be contacting them either purposely or accidentally. What are your thoughts on this? Anyway, that's all I have time for this week. Thank you to my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video. You can join the community with the link below. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe. Hey space cats, fly with me to the stars.